much for this introduction and uh, first I would like to convey my thanks for the organizing committee for accepting my presentation and uh, if I may I will try to share my screen because I prepare a presentation I hope you are now seeing it well okay. yes I can see that anyway thank you very much so with no further delay I will get into into the topic. So the legal landscape of land bomb, of uh, air bombardment during the World War II. But basically, <clears throat> my personal history of the law of the air warfare, because the, this is the area of the international humanitarian law that I am specializing, started with the with the legal consideration concerning the bombardment of the Polish town of Wielun. Actually, the Wielun was is still being considered to be a first military action of the World War II. Actually, many historians believe it all started around 440. Actually, there are new developments in this case, and we do believe that the exit time of bombing uh, is probably something around 540. Uh, basically, why the Vieloin is um, um, why the Vieloin is actually being uh, um, being presented in this presentation? Because, in my opinion, it's a law of air warfare in a nutshell. Because from uh, one point of view, we we may assume that it was an obvious war crime and action directed against the town without any military significance. But on the other hand, if we get, go to, through the further details regarding the law of the air bombardment, the, the landscape, the legal landscape, the legal architecture concerning the air bombardment gets more and more murky, blurred, and more and more ambiguous. And uh, of course, uh, the bombardment of the Polish towns and cities in September 1949 were part of the claims submitted by the Polish government in exile. And uh, this matter was considered by the first committee. And the first committee, well, just set a simple question. Is the bombardment of undefended places a war crime? Because that was the main argument of the Polish government in exile, that the bombardment of not only Wieluń, but also multiple other cities like Warsaw, uh, is the prohibited bombardment of undefended places. Well, basically, uh, if we, for instance, take a look through the Oppenheim's war crimes catalog, we may found the bombardment of undefended places as an example of the war crime, as well in the 1990 report on the Commission on the Responsibility of the Autos of War and the Enforcement of Penalties. What happened later? However, as, of course, Commission operates during the time of war, we have to, we cannot uh, somehow forget that uh, the case of the air bombardment was definitely a double-edged sword for international justice after World War II. Because on the one hand, we do have a conduct of uh, Luftwaffe, uh, especially during the first two years of, uh, of, of war uh, operation directed not only against Poland, but also against Netherlands, USSR, Yugoslavia, the, the forgotten bombardment of Belgrade in April 1941, the bombing of Coventry, the Blitz over Britain. But on the other hand, we do have uh, uh, the combined bomber offensive against Germany, uh, a, widespread, a widespread massive strategic bombardment of German cities based on morale bombing doctrine, and also the conduct of uh, American air forces against Japan uh, in 1944 and 1945. So the destruction was definitely mutual. So what does the law say? Well, the law, of course, uh, when we are talking about the 1907 or 18, uh, 1899 Hague Peace Conference, of course, the aircraft was, um, well, not perceived as a, as a weapon of war yet. Still, actually, uh, uh, the regime concerning the land bombardment suggests that uh, bombing the undefended uh, urban areas is prohibited because basically the military said, okay, we agree with this legal, uh, legal constraint because from our perspective, uh, there is an alignment of legal and military perspective. It's pretty essential, in my opinion, when we are talking about the development of the international humanitarian law, the law of war, that the both perspective, perspective of military and, and humanitarian need to align. And basically the military said, well, that's, uh, that's something we could accept because there is no point in wasting ammunition. However, there was one grave consequence. If the city was defended, if the city, um, uh, if the city is resisting the occupation, 
the actually Article 25 by default accept the indiscriminate bombardment because basically uh, the attacker was allowed not only to confine his artillery fire only to the pockets of resistance, but actually could force the population uh, um, uh, by, by indiscriminate bombardment, force them to, to, to surrender, to put some kind of morale, to put some kind of pressure on the morale. In 1907, actually, we do have some developments in the aerial technology, and we do have the invention of Wright brothers, we do have the airships like the Zeppelin airship, and basically, uh, basically, um, uh, there is uh, the, there was a need that the Article Twenty Five, the Hague Regulation, need to be amended accordingly to cover the air bombardment. So this is this nice addition by whatever means uh, was added, and basically Article Twenty Five was not only applicable in times of land bombardment, but also by if we take a good note through the nineteen zero seven Hague Peaks Conference proceedings. We could find out that uh, delegates would like also to 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 uh, expand the the scope of the applicability of the provision also to the cases of the air bombardment. However, another issue: how to measure, assess whether the town, a city, or building is defended in the context of the air operation. So we have to remember that you no know, anti-aircraft weapon existed in 1907. However, of course, this rapidly changed after World War One. And uh, when the war to started, even small infantry units were able to, to engage with military aviation. So uh, is it one gun enough to consider the whole area as a defendant or not? Uh, and so when we are talking, for instance, the status of the Warsaw of 1939 bombardment, and actually uh, the, the, the logic of the Article 25 collapsed because, for instance, Karl Bodenschaft, who was a liaison officer of uh, Hermann Goering, he actually was asked by the by the Robert Jackson about the circumstances of uh, by the Allah, including those directly responsible for bombardment of towns and cities during the September 1949. None of them actually were charged with the indiscriminate air bombardment. I'm in a breakout room now. Because we do have uh, we do have uh, uh, the Kessel Link, uh, we do have uh, uh, battle. Oh, also, Gehring, uh, uh, those persons were apprehended by the by the Allies, but none of them actually uh, received any charges. Uh, um, uh, uh, Article 6b uh, of the IMT Charter also pointed out that the wanton destruction of cities, towns is not, not justified by military necessity is a war crime. However, all those charges were formulated only in the regard of the land operation. Uh, so it was the decision of the commission to leave the air bombardment outside the scope of the IMT. Uh, however, there were moments during the uh, International Military Tribunal and the subsequent Nuremberg trials, there were moments that actually the defendants claimed the two quoque argument, and it almost caused the IMT leg legitimacy. So it was, a, as I said, a double-edged sword. Uh, the committee, the third committee, actually forward more uh, some extra conclusions, pointing out that uh, they never considered that deliberate bombardment of undefended places was a war crime in the context of air operation. That the nature, whether the location is defended, had never been defined. And even if we take the hug rules of the air warfare, we still cannot forward any any conclusion in this regard. So basically, I would say that. Um, uh, the, the committee, uh, by referring to the London Protocol and to the process of Admiral Carl Dennis, and actually pointing out that probably the law of the air warfare collapsed completely, I would say, uh, even due to the process called desuetudo, or even uh, they suggest that actually the air warfare was somehow a non-liquid uh, norm situation, that actually no law could be actually attributed, uh, would be applicable in the context of air operations. So I would say uh, the committee actually, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going now to conclude, that the committee uh, did not consider the cases of uh, air bombardment before the 1920, uh, 1939 and actually also did not apprehend the role of the hack rule of air warfare and any other possibles of the law of air warfare, leaving this matter completely unsettled. And I would say um, uh, the most fundamental question was omitted, how to define the military objective, how the commission actually defined the military objective. And I think this silence, this silence of the Nuremberg, and I think the silence of the committee as well, has significant grave consequence for the future conflicts like Korea and Vietnam. Because until the 1977, we do not have 
uh, uh, any any clear uh, clear uh, international treaty regulating the conduct of hostilities. So I think my time is up. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm ready for for any question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mateus. Uh, so we will we will have time for questions afterwards. So we will come back. So I but I will just keep it moving now and pass the microphone on if you want to go ahead and unmute yourself to to Professor Robert Cribb. Okay, John, thanks very much. And uh, good evening from, uh, it's quite late here in Canberra in Australia. So first of all, thanks to the organizers for putting on this uh, very interesting uh, conference. So the, the work of the UNWCC identified the legal basis for post-war prosecution of Japanese, German and Italian personnel for, uh, for war crimes. But I want to argue today that this basis was compromised by a confusion that was embedded in UNWCC WCC thinking uh, about the definition of war crimes. So it was a pretty fundamental problem that arose in the, uh, uh, in the work of the UNWCC. Uh, basically, they were juggling with two distinct and in many respects contradictory definitions of war crimes. One was the understanding that war crimes were a breach of the laws of war as they related to uh, behavior between or among armies, armed forces. Uh, and the other was the understanding of war crimes as atrocities, particularly atrocities against uh, civilians. In other words, the abuse of belligerent rights in which soldiers, uh, belligerent rights permit soldiers to cause harm to civilians as long as it's proportionate uh, and to the military advantage of the, uh, of the soldiers. Um, but doesn't permit uh, atrocity. So there were two separate conceptions of uh, war crimes that were that produced, I think, a highly unproductive result uh, from the UNWCC. Um, and the, the consequence was that the post-war trials process, uh, to the extent that it was based on UNWCC, uh, WCC thinking uh, was open to or was vulnerable to charges both of vindictive victors justice, justice and to leaving unfinished the business of reckoning with wartime atrocity. Um, so in making this criticism, I don't want to deny the impressive work of the UNWCC uh, in difficult circumstances dealing with governments that were not were often not uh, particularly receptive to its uh, work, but I don't think we should resile from the conclusion that uh, some of the work of the Commission ended up being seriously counterproductive. Now, uh, Francis Lieber appears to have credit for the first use of the term war crimes, but that was in private uh, correspondence in 1865. The term only became a matter of public legal discourse in the early 20th century when it was identified as a legal category by Oppenheim in his 1906 book, uh, International Law a Treatise. And he defines it there as an act which may be met with punishment by the enemy. So as he makes clear, this is a legal, not a moral category. Uh, it's an act which breaches the reciprocal understanding amongst armed forces of how each side should behave in relation to other armed forces. Uh, so Oppenheim gives the example, he, he, he goes to some lengths to point out that this is not a moral category. He points out that actions such as espionage may be heroic, may be morally uh, uh, commendable, but nonetheless may be war crimes. In other words, they can be punished by the, uh, the enemy force that captures a, uh, a spy. Similar issues, uh, destruction of equipment and supplies after, uh, after surrender. So uh, Oppenheim makes clear that war crimes are breaches of the road rules in a sense that uh, otherwise govern the effective conduct of, uh, of warfare. And the prosecution of war crimes is purely deterrent. It's not implementing a, uh, a moral punishment on soldiers for um, doing wrong. 
It's meant to make sure that armies understand that if they do commit war crimes, then there will be serious consequences uh, for, them, for them. So strongly reciprocal. Uh, and this is one reason why it, th this idea of war crimes applied only to so-called civilized uh, countries, uh, countries that did not, um, or combat combatants who could not be expected to adhere to uh, uh, these conventions were similarly not protected by them because they were not universal principles. And when Japan, for instance, uh, chose not to sign the Geneva Convention, or rather it signed but didn't ratify the 1929 Geneva Convention, uh, there was no suggestion that this was a sign of uh, moral failing on the part of Japan. It was expressed in terms of what Japan saw as a, a lack of reciprocal advantage. Um, Japan failed to ratify, Ireland failed to ratify, Finland failed to ratify. It was simply a diplomatic calculation of what was in the interests of the country. Um, now, this approach to war crimes had two important consequences. Uh, first, it meant that the prosecution of war crimes was necessarily one-sided. An enemy prosecuted soldiers from the other side whom it could capture as a means of creating a deterrent. And in the absence of a moral dimension, there was no suggestion that uh, one side would punish its own soldiers for committing war crimes uh, because, there was, because there was nothing immoral in a war crime. Uh, second consequence was that the scope of war crimes trials was limited to wartime. It was intended as deterrent within a single conflict and it made no sense. And indeed it was considered legally impossible to prosecute war crimes after the conclusion of a peace treaty. As Oppenheim made clear, you could, uh, one country could be allied to a country that had been its enemy in, the previous, in a previous conflict and you would not expect to have prosecutions hanging over the alliance from a previous uh, conflict. And um, now this understanding of war crimes was then challenged in the First World War by atrocities committed by German troops in Belgium against civilians, rape and murder, and against property, the, uh, the pointless destruction of, uh, of buildings. And out of this, out of disgust with German behavior, there arose an alternative uh, definition, which was one of um, wartime acts of force by combatants that went beyond reasonable demands of the situation and which grossly offended against common ideas of, uh, of decent behavior. Um, the confusion between these two definitions of war crimes was embedded in the work of the Commission on Responsibilities at uh, Versailles in 1919, uh, which put forward, on the one hand, Oppenheimer's ideas of war crimes as breaches of un the understanding between armed forces, also put forward atrocities against civilians, and additionally put together, uh, put with them actions that we would perhaps consider today to be crimes against peace, uh, debasing currency, denationalizing population, and uh, usurping sovereignty. Certainly acts that we wouldn't regard as, uh, uh, as, a, as atrocities in their own right. Um, but the commission, it seems to me, fell short of actually defining war crimes. What it wanted to do was to lift the protection of belligerent rights from soldiers who committed atrocities and to permit them to be prosecuted in national courts. In other words, they would lose their normal uh, <clears throat> uh, military immunity from prosecution uh, by, by virtue of this, this decision. Um, but the, the striking thing is in fact that the, the term war crime largely disappeared after the First World War. Uh, it was not used significantly at the time of the bombing of Guernica. It was not used to refer to the 1937-38 uh, Nanjing atrocity. Terms like atrocity, terms like excess were, uh, were used. And it was really only revived as a legal term by the UNCC in its work after 
1943. And the problem then was that the UNWCC continued this bundling together of highly inconsistent elements in its notion of, uh, of war crimes. So it was not just breaches of the understanding amongst uh, armed forces, it was also those atrocities against civilians that were uh, uh, enumerated by the Commission of, uh, on Responsibilities, rape, murder, torture, and so forth, <clears throat> forced, forced prostitution, uh, but also even the Geneva Convention on the Treatment of Prisoners of War, which, as you know, established rather high standards for the treatment of prisoners of war, making so the UNWCC by this action turned into or included in the category war crime, things like exposing prisoners to public curiosity, uh, using prisoners for military purposes and failing to segregate prisoners uh, of war uh, ethnically and nationally. Uh, these things are elements in the Geneva Convention. We wouldn't necessarily regard them as good, but they're not atrocities. So there was a kind of grab bag of topics that were considered by the UNWCC to be war crimes, uh, crimes against civilians, crimes amongst armies. Um, so in that extension of the concept of war crimes, the UNWCC is rightly regarded as the work of the UNWCC is rightly regarded as a, uh, as a landmark. So it was the first time that uh, acts, atrocities such as rape and massacre, excuse me, and torture could be prosecuted in foreign uh, tribunals. But the UNWCC retained Oppenheim's provision that only soldiers of the defeated side could be prosecuted. Um, so um, Amina made quite a lot of universal jurisdiction but it was actually a very limited universal jurisdiction. There was no sense and no provision in the UNWCC for any prosecution of war crimes committed on the allied side. So the UNWCC was created or rather it created a mandate for victor's justice in which Japanese and Germans and Italians were prosecuted for atrocities, whereas allied perpetrators were, were not. So there may have been a universal principle, torture, rape, massacre may have been recognized as uh, international crimes, but the procedure that followed from the UNWCC uh, work was selective and partisan. In his opening address to the INT in Nuremberg, uh, Robert Jackson appealed to what he called the, uh, the laws of humanity and the dictates of the public, uh, public conscience. Um, and of course, the trials that followed did achieve significant justice against uh, perpetrators. Uh, but the legal basis set by the UNWCC did not uphold Jackson's appeal to the laws of humanity. And instead it un underpinned a, a partisan and unbalanced uh, regime, which failed to create a sense of uh, universality of crime and which, as other people have commented, made or liberated the British in Kenya, the Dutch in Indonesia, the French in Indochina to commit war crimes or to commit what we would now regard as war crimes, to commit atrocities with no sense that they were in breach of, uh, no consciousness that they were in breach of international law. Um, and yet at the same time, the UNWCC set up an expectation of comprehensive reckoning, which also failed to be delivered, at least by the Asian trials process, because following Oppenheim, the trials had to cease at the time of the, or by the time of the peace treaty. San Francisco peace treaty signed in 1951 and came, coming into effect in 1952. Um, so there was no sense that that universality in time or space was supported by the UNWCC uh, work. So once again, I don't want to suggest that the UNWCC was useless or uh, negligent, 
but it seems to me that there was a failure, a, a crucial failure of will in its work, a failure to resolve the fundal, fundamental contradiction between those two concepts of uh, war crimes that produced a confusion, which in turn led to the very, very long delay between the pair or the set of international tribunals, uh, international and national tribunals that followed the Second World War and the um, setting up of the um, ICTY and the ICTR. So thank you very much. That's great. Thank you very much, Robert. Um, so we will move on now to our final speaker, who is Dr. Megan Donaldson at the University College London. Over to you, Megan. Thanks very much. Can you uh, hear me and see the slide presentation? Yes, loud and clear. Wonderful. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks Amina. Thanks everyone for this opportunity to talk about something other than COVID-related administration. I really relish it and look forward to it. And I see already some unanticipated intersections between my work and the work of the other panelists, both on aerial bombardment, something which was discussed in connection with Ethiopia, particularly the difficulty of bombardment of undefended places. And this question of the definition of war crimes, although I have a slightly different angle of emphasis to Robert. What I'm gonna talk about today grows out of um, draft work uh, that, I, that, that I'm working on and developing at the moment. Um, I've worked on the history of international law and that's included the history of Ethiopia in the interwar uh, years. And I now teach international criminal law. So becoming more and more acquainted with that territory. And I was asked to write um, a, a long entry for one of the Max Planck encyclopedias about why there had been no prosecutions of Italians for war crimes committed in Ethiopia um, in 1935 to, to 41. Now, of course, um, faced with such a question, one can think immediately of a few answers. And the obvious answers are in fact the, the correct answers. It wasn't clear that I needed thousands of words to elaborate them. But in the process of working on this, um, I did have some reflections about how to tell this story and particularly um, what place the UN War Crimes Commission archive held in, in narratives of this period. And that in turn opened some broader um, re-examinations for me of the, the legal and historical categories that we use to think about these years and the Italo-Ethiopian War. So that's broadly the sequence that I'll follow today, just um, follow the, the way in which these questions were opened up for me by the research. From the standpoint of the UN War Crimes Commission archives, one could be forgiven for thinking that the primary obstacles to Ethiopia conducting uh, war crimes prosecutions were legal. So the War Crimes Commission archives are rich and they include some dense and nuanced and revealing discussions, primarily of um, the jurisdiction of the War Crimes Commission, how far back it went, Related to that, uh, whether the Italo-Ethiopian War, as it was referred to, was part of World War II, in other words, part of the matter, part of the, the complex of violence that the War Crimes Commission was dealing with. There was then the, the difficult matter of Ethiopia's precise legal status in the years, say, 1936 um, to 41, so following Italy's um, sort of proclamation of annexation to the liberation of Addis Ababa by uh, British forces with Haile Selassie in 41. And the UN War Crimes Commission archives in fact show Ethiopia prevailing on these points. Uh, Ethiopia benefited from effective advocacy by um, a, a Swedish lawyer who was then acting as their attorney general. And uh, his arguments combined with the intrinsic uh, logic of aspects of the case were persuasive to the commission, despite the fairly persistent efforts by British and US and other uh, Western European representatives to stifle the Ethiopian initiative. But if one pulls back from the War Commission archives and looks to the foreign ministry archives in, in the leading European powers in the US, it's very clear that these legal questions that are debated at such length in the War Crimes Commission are purely tangential. Right? There was never going to be, whether the Italian suspects were listed or not, any support 
from the major allied powers for extraditions of these individuals for prosecution. So all of the obstacles that Ethiopia faced to even having individuals listed were as nothing relative to the obstacles that they were going to face in getting the practical support and pressure on Italy they would need in order to prosecute. I will add as an aside that in this whole array of evidence in the War Crimes Commission and obviously the Foreign Ministry archives, there is very little insight on the actual thinking of the Ethiopian uh, post-war regime. So we have memoirs of some foreign advisors who are working with Haile Selassie and the Ethiopian uh, government. We have translations from Amharic texts of some individuals who were part of that post-war um, governing elite, but there's very little light shed on the actual expectations of the Ethiopians. And in some respects, there's a bit of a tendency to think back and, and cast the Ethiopian regime as a somewhat naive um, hero of the story. But I suspect that actually um, the regime understood very well that this was not going to be a terribly successful initiative. They saw it as a possibly a largely symbolic one. So just to, <laughs> by way of note, there, there is a lot that we don't know about the actual driving force of one of the key political actors here. So it follows from what I've said that if one was to write the story from the UN War Crimes Commission archive, one would come up with a largely misleading answer on the obstacles to prosecution. One would be too focused on these technical legal questions, which in many cases were purely pretextual. Nevertheless, there is something of great value, I think, in the War Crimes Commission deliberations. And in particular, um, they do what I've described as opening up rival theories of the political status of Ethiopia and the nature of the violence. So on the Italian and British narrative, uh, the idea is that Ethiopian sovereignty is extinguished, moment of de Bellasio. Italian sovereignty is recognized by a large number of powers, de facto and then de jure. The country, when it is uh, liberated, counts as occupied enemy territory and Ethiopian sovereignty only re-emerges uh, post that moment with British support. The Ethiopian theory um, is that sovereignty is never extinguished and there is a constant military resistance throughout the Italian uh, presence, even if it's somewhat patchy. This plays out in a couple of areas of the War Crimes Commission deliberations. There's in the discussion of the nature of the war and the connection to World War II, a very clear confrontation between these different theories. And in fact, the intricacies of the peacemaking, the fact that the Italian, the Treaty of Peace with Italy, ends the war with the Allies and with Ethiopia at the same time, uh, suggests that there's a tacit acceptance in the end of the Ethiopian theory that in fact this was part of a continuous conflict and that the conflict was ongoing even after the point of Italian pronounced annexation. Has to be said though that the rhetoric, the reference to invasion and occupation and so on continues to suggest that there was a war that ended prior to that point, even if the legal case, what's moving under the surface of the legal categories uh, suggest the opposite. This also surfaces this conflict between the theories of what was actually occurring um, in the definition of crimes. This is a messy discussion, very unsatisfying actually, um, but the gist of it is that individuals are listed for war crimes, which includes crimes against humanity with a nexus to war, um, both associated with the initial invasion, but also which took place in well after the initial invasion and well after this theoretical moment of de Bellazio. And there was no real discussion, it seems to me, of the fact that they were considering as war crimes, i.e. as crimes associated with an ongoing conflict, things which had happened uh, well after the moment the conflict had theoretically ended. Why does this matter? Um, it's an ongoing question, I think. Um, because as there is renewed focus on the nature of Italian violence, both through historical work and through a number of other disciplines, the tendency of lawyers, including lawyers who are very knowledgeable about international criminal law and international humanitarian law, is to respond with the legal categories we now take for granted. And this, um, by reverting to the kind of US, UK, French, Italian position, that the war had ended, at least by 36. 
And you see this, in, for example, in a response by Antonio Cassese in 2006 to evidence that came to light of an, a new massacre in the so-called Zeret caves. This is the use of mustard gas and machine gun fire against a large number of guerrillas and uh, a large number of women and children as well in 39, right? So theoretically, the end of the war is long past. I think going back into the War Crimes Commission treatment of this period opens up, right, for broader scrutiny, um, the persistent legal categorizations of what happened in these years and the questions about those categorizations. And the broader conflict, I think, is between what we think of as a war crime and how we think of colonial administration. There's one narrative of where that line sits coming from the Allied camp and quite another, I think, when we look closely at the legal rationalization in the War Crimes Commission. Um, I'll just put the references there in case we are visually recording this as well, just to acknowledge the work on which I've drawn. Many thanks, look forward to questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Megan. Okay, so that's three really, um, really rich papers there and some very interesting intersections between them as well, I think, and um, some some explicit, some, some more implicit. So I'll open it up to the floor for now. If um, people want to put their hand up, turn on their microphone, unmute themselves and, and intervene that way. We can also use the chat if anyone's unable to... Uh, to ask your question through 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 the microphone but um please do feel free um i see amina has her hand up there so i'll maybe go to you first amina and let everyone else uh, have time to gather their thoughts so over to you amina thanks very much uh, to all three panelists for those really insightful papers um, I was in and out of some of the panels at the first during the first presentation, so I'm afraid I didn't catch all of that one. Um, but uh, the the ones I did catch in full were uh, were, were really um, good. So thanks very much for that. I had a question for um, uh, Megan. Um, so I was wondering, you talked about um, how um, or you talked about the the the, the difference in in determining what whether or not war crimes had been committed in in um, Ethiopia and whether or not it came under the definition of war crimes at the time um, as established by the, the the great powers. So I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that a bit more, please. Yeah, so there's all kinds of um, lower level questions like, for example, whether you can use bombing of undefended places given that the Ethiopians fought in guerrilla formations and therefore what, what might seem an undefended place was actually a place of military significance and so on. There's also questions about an attempt to use, for example, mass denationalization as, as something akin to a genocide offense. There's all kind of flex about the detail. But the real point is this question of the nexus to war. So the Italian theory, which is largely accepted by Britain, which, which accepts Italian sovereignty, de jure, um, after having done so de facto, is that to the extent there is an Italo-Ethiopian war, it's a punctual war, it ends at a particular point, somewhere in 36, and all the violence which occurs after that point is therefore just a routine part of colonial administration. It's not a war crime. It, there's no nexus there. And yet, there is obvious continuity in the nature of the violence, um, from the period of the invasion right through. And that, that includes the use of mustard gas, that includes, I think to a lesser extent, aerial bombardment. Um, and the, the kinds of large scale massacres which are associated with the Yekata 12 period, this is 1937, this is massacres in the streets of Addis Ababa and then waves of violence out into the countryside, very large scale violence, clearly crimes against humanity in today's definition, right? But, and it, it, these are offences which are picked up and are part of the evidence base that undergirds the listing. But on a theory of, of the definition of war crimes, which requires a nexus to conflict, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't make sense with the prevailing allied approach to the characterization of what the Italo-Ethiopian war was and when it ended. That's the, that's the main kind of puzzle. Mm. 
Thank you, Megan. That's really interesting. Okay, uh, do we have any more uh, questions, uh, comments for our speakers? Uh, Robert, would you like to uh, come back in there? Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to add that, uh, of course, there's a, a really striking parallel with Japan's uh, movement into Manchuria and the creation of Manchukuo as a uh, as a client state. Um, and really, the only difference in international law, it seems, is that uh, the Italian annexation of Ethiopia was uh, recognized a yure, whereas the uh, Japanese creation of Manchukuo um, had only very limited international recognition, even though there was a great deal of de facto recognition. You know, I should say also that the whole story in international law today about what happened with Ethiopian sovereignty remains very unsettled. So Crawford has a nice observation in his creation of states in international law about the sort of retrospectiveness of, of international law's treatment of um, Ethiopia. Because on one hand, the British recognized an Italian annexation de jure. Then as the war broke out, they withdrew that recognition. But the de facto recognition probably persisted. And Britain always talked in terms of the reappearance of an independent Ethiopia, right? That's a, a in a sense, a suggestion that sovereignty had been interrupted in some way. But the peace treaty uh, with the allies in Italy, which included Ethiopia and Italy, contains provisions on post liminium, which suggests that Italian, uh, that Ethiopian rights, sorry, extended right back to 35, right back to the invasion. And that's a tacit acceptance, I think, of the theory that of uninterrupted sovereignty during that period. So I think the dominant story about what happened in Ethiopia is still a bit confused, <laughs> but we're certainly not seeing in the surface of your average textbook treatment today a recognition of the complexity or of the fact that what the, the War Crimes Commission ended up doing was to treat what we consider acts of colonial administration as war crimes. They took them seriously as war crimes. It was an important part of what undergirded the listing of what ended up being um, you know, eight individuals and a couple of suspects. Yes, thank you. If I may contribute to this very interesting discussion. Go ahead. Yes, thank you. Well, the, the case of Ethiopia, it's also particularly interesting from my perspective because, well, actually, I, I found a lot of remarks regarding the conduct of Italian Air Force in the documents of the League of Nations, because actually League of Nations was, um, was investigated, uh, investigating at the time the cases of the air bombardment uh, also directed against the Red Cross, uh, Red Cross uh, echelons and uh, hospitals. And actually, uh, the Italian approach was that uh, basically because the Ethiopia lost its sovereignty, uh, the Ethiopian Red Cross is no longer being recognized as a, a, as a society that could be uh, um, that could be attributed to the Ethiopian state. And basically they always said that because they were fired from that uh, column or that uh, town or that urban area, they basically consider it as a defendant. Uh, well, basically what you were saying about Ethiopia is pretty pretty fascinating because the conquest, it was uh, the, we, we consider the conquest uh, at least uh, since the acceptance of the Paris Pact of the briand kellogg Pact as a unlawful method of acquiring the territory. So the consequence uh, also due to the example of the Professor Creep of Manjuria through the Stimson doctrine, uh, the conquest mean that uh, basically the international community could not accept this situation as a lawful. And in a matter of the euro and uh, the factor recognition, I would also refer to the interesting case of the Baltic states, which also how the Baltic states, uh, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia, annexation by the USSR in 1940, only I guess United States, the Vatican, and I think the Ireland also, uh, did not recognize um, uh, uh, the euro and de facto the, the, the annexation of the Baltic states, while uh, France and Great 
Britain, I believe, it was some kind of uh, de facto recognition, for instance, moving the transfers, uh, moving the money of the central banks uh, located in London to the, uh, to the USSR uh, central bank was also kind of involved. So, so the matter of sovereignty, the, the matter, because it's qu quite fascinating, because we consider the cutoff date of considering the conquest as a lawful method of acquiring, ter uh, acquiring territory in international law is 1929, the acceptance of the Paris Pact. Uh, that's at least what is told, and this is this is part of the IMT reasoning when constructing the crime against peace. That the, the, this is the cutoff moment. That before it, okay, the aggression. Uh, well, it was not very settled in international, but after the acceptance of the of the Briand Kellogg Pact, is no longer being considered as a lawful means of resolving the international disputes. So anything which comes afterwards, uh, the conquest is delegalized, and the international community could not recognize it. So pretty pretty interesting remark. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mateus. Um, I might just say on this, I think there, there is something deeply anomalous about Ethiopia in so many ways. It is a very rare independent country in Africa at the time. It's, it's a member of the League, which uh, in its admission came caught a lot of people by surprise. It was a sort of diplomatic coup for Ethiopia to get that far. Um, but a, a really deep part of the way that Ethiopia is treated in the 30s, including when it's raising these complaints in the League of Nations, is the fact that it is in Africa. I mean, the, the colonial, the imperial dimensions of it is completely inextricable from it. And, it's absolutely right that there's a strong argument, indeed, <laughs> the Nuremberg findings depend on the fact that we see in the Kellogg-Briand Pact the end of, of, of force as a basis for title to territory, but that really didn't give a lot of pause in Ethiopia because this was part of a landscape of colonial war. That's definitely the way the Italian coming down from Libya. This is just a continuation of what they've been doing for years and under the liberal regime, not only under Mussolini. And for the British and the French, you know, Ethiopian sovereignty was of a different kind, I think, to sovereignty elsewhere. So I think that that, that particular contradiction comes back to the, the status of, of an African polity in the system. Yeah, I mean, that idea of, you know, there's obviously a lot being written about that kind of, you know, not quite sovereignty or hybrid sovereignty of, of Ethiopia in that moment. I think one of the things that all of your papers have done quite well here is highlighting, you know, these ambiguities or these uncertainties that you're discussing in, in their different contexts. The, you know, the um, failure of, of the UNWCC and related institutions at the time to resolve some of these questions, the contradictions or the confusions between them, you know, that were there, there, that, you know, they, they have all had their own kind of legacies or continuities to eat through to today and you know, if we think about that question about the uncertainty between or, or the this the um overly um overly kind of determinative distinction between you know when is the when does the international conflict end versus the the imperial or the colonial intervention being something completely different and we have and you know how that intersects with questions of sovereignty you know we see elements of that in you know in, in different kind of forms in with the interventions in Syria or, or in Afghanistan or, or in Palestine in, in different ways today so I don't know if, if any of you would have thoughts on you know how these things continue to to reverberate today I was struck also by your points Robert about the um the distinction the confusion between those two def definition of war crimes and and the impact that had or, or you know the relationship that had to the gap in international criminal law for a long time after Nuremberg I wasn't sure if you were also making the point that there was a, a specific link between you know those two the, the confusion over those two competing um verse, definitions of war crimes and what you know did that feed into or was that directly part of the the, the victor's justice argument is, is that is part of the reason that uh, that the, the colonial atrocities do with those definitional questions or were, were they too 
parallel points. And I think, Megan, you said you had a, a slightly different um, interpretation of the work crimes definition uh, issues. So I maybe just invite you to, if you wanted to say anything more about that as well. So that's to open it back up to all three of you, really. If anyone wants to go first. Okay, so th yeah, thanks very much, John. That's, those are really good points. Um, so I was suggesting that the the fact that in the Asian sphere only Japanese were were tried for war crimes, and there was no possibility of uh, considering war crimes committed by allies, meant by allied personnel, uh, meant that even though the number of Japanese war crimes was, of course very, very much greater than the number of war crimes uh, committed on the Allied side. Uh, it created a, uh, a framework of victor's justice in which only the defeated side was being, uh, was being prosecuted and in which no opportunity was uh, exercised to, uh, to apply similar standards to people on the, uh, on the Western, uh, to, to perpetrators on the Allied side. Um, and I, um, well, Sandra Wilson, who's here, has uh, worked on the uh, the Korean War, and has argued that the one of the big reasons why there were no war crimes trials in the Korean War was that uh, it, there was so many war crimes committed by the South Koreans that it would have been deeply embarrassing to put North Koreans and Chinese on trial and not to prosecute. Uh, uh, South Koreans under the under the same principle. That's really interesting. Okay, thank you for that. Um, um, yes. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Go. You, okay, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna have to pick one of you. I'll go by alphabetically M A rather than M E. So go ahead, Matthias. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, uh, well, definitely, I think it, I'm guessing the, the the case of the air bombardments is a great illustration of the the victorious justice. But well, maybe of course the the if we go into more more detailed examination, we. we can cannot simply say and make uh, some kind of equation between the German conduct of warfare in case of air bombardment or allied conduct of warfare, because of course, we have to remember about the technical difficulties. We have to remember about that the war in the air slightly differs in 1940 during the bombardment of Great Britain and slightly different in 1945. So that's that's the first, uh, first conclusion. And also legally, it's hard to say because um, there are a lot of discussion uh, regarding uh, backwards application of the law of war. Like for instance, the doctrine of military objectives well, whether it was existing in the time of World War II. And for instance, I would refer to the Shimoda famous ruling of the Tokyo District Court in Shimoda case, when actually uh, the case was dealing with the atomic bombardment of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, which in fact was at the core uh, uh, as, a, as a part of the air bombardment. And basically, uh, for instance, uh, for instance, conclude that the hug rules of air warfare are part of customary international law. So in this regard, it turned the table 180 degrees completely, saying that uh, we could uh, we could refer to the Allied bombardment uh, in a completely different manner. But I think it was highly contested uh, uh, by the by the lawyers at the time this ruling, and it, it is somehow contested today. So basically, yes, I, I fully agree that uh, this perspective, this uh, this perspective that because even if the judges were were arriving to the to the nuremberg uh, to the to the to this uh, uh, peace uh, to the justice palace in nuremberg uh, the nuremberg was completely destroyed and actually those judges arriving to the courthouse were actually seeing the destruction committed by the by the air bombardments and basically i think the commission and the whole uh, post war um, post war justice was somehow uh, um, somehow convinced that that we have to, let's say, 
uh, leave it out of the table because the consequence, if we are going to somehow address also the activity of the allies, especially because not we are not talking only about the allied bombing, but what about, for instance, participation of the USSR between 1949 and 1941, right? And basically, well, uh, uh, the, 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 the aggression against the Baltic states, against Poland, and etc. and etc. So basically, uh, that was even more apparent in Europe, but also in, in Japan. Japan, like we do have this separate, not we do not have the separate decision, we have separate judgment, yes, of Justice Paul that actually was published 10 years after the Japan signed a treaty with, uh, the signed a peace treaty. So I think, so I think, uh, of course, uh, this context, this geo geopolitical context that is being somehow interfering with the law, it's still very, very, very active nowadays and was definitely active back to the 1945. Thank you very much. Megan? I think Robert looks like he wants to come in on this um, question, so. Yes, I was just going to add the point that uh, uh, in there was an extra complication in Southeast Asia because Allied planes were bombing cities in what had formerly been their own colonies. So the Allies were bombing Rangoon for instance, today's Yangon, um, and they caused many hundreds of, of deaths. And in one of the war crimes trials where Japanese were being prosecuted for a massacre, a point made in the defense was that the British had just themselves killed a similar number of Burmese in bombing um, at a time when Rangoon was on the, uh, the front line. So what was the difference between that mass killing of Burmese and the mass killing that was carried out in the village of Kalagong. Um, just, John, to come back to the questions you, you asked, I definitely don't disagree with, with Robert on this, the substance of the point that, that he's making, you know, that, that there is a sort of tension, I think, at the heart of the, the effort to conceptualise war crimes in this period. Um, it's it's just that the tension that comes up for me actually is to do with the nexus to conflict and the story we're otherwise telling ourselves about what happened between Italy and Ethiopia. But the the point that John uh, that that Robert makes about the kind of shakiness of the conceptual underpinnings of war crimes um, that the lawyers who are in exile are also playing a role in trying to push uh, international organization to prosecute or to... ...cases for human rights of, war, of the war crimes trials then underway. And the fact that they wrote this reflective document and the, there's an extensive uh, discussion... But the bit that's really shaky now is, is what's the conceptual underpinning of crimes against humanity? What unites all of these subsections together? What, what holds this together coherently? And now that we're drafting a convention on crimes against humanity, that's back at the surface. So it's this pattern of the evolution and, and reactive definition of crimes lacking a kind of inner, inner logic, I think, which recurs and is still, still an issue today. And it's one of the differences between uh, the European and Asian theatres, because there was no prosecution for, uh, in effect, no prosecution for crimes against humanity in Asia. It was all uh, brought within the concept of war crimes. Also, to add one, one interesting thing, that like actually Japan, uh, uh, as far as I remember, adopted a special act and bill called the Enemy Airmen Act that actually punished Allied airmen who were captured for violating the laws of war regarding the air bombardment. And was this quite ironically, some of the Allied uh, Allied crew members, some of the Allied pilots were executed under under this order. But basically, uh, and afterwards, the the members of the of the of the of the bench were tried by the Allied commissions, and actually they were Allied under charges of not uh, not establishing the the, the framework of, of fair trial for the for the Allied prisoners of war. But basically, the the commissions never actually got in the substance of this act that basically this act could be considered as a part of uh, punishment of the war crime itself established within the framework of Japanese criminal 
uh, uh, criminal uh, system. Uh, I think it's clearly clearly does not correspond with the, for instance, the Amashita, what what uh, what uh, United States Supreme Court uh, laid down in the Yamashita case. So I think, yes, this, this is somehow kind of ironic, I would say, in some circumstances. Thank you.